the day the podcast got released, they started to alter the SV40 Wikipedia page. And the reason why is they want people to think that it's normal to have SV40 in the human genome and it's not. Remember, in the podcast with Bobby Kennedy, what did I say? Um, they were gonna have to get this messenger RNA somehow across the nuclear membrane. And the only way to get that genetic information across the nuclear membrane is to use the SV40 promoter. And because, and this is, this is a really important point for people to understand, Hello and welcome. I'm Sarah, and this is part one of my interview with Dr. Jack Cruz. And if you've never heard of Dr. Cruz before, he's a very experienced neurosurgeon. He's also a polymath and a quantum biologist. And in this video, he's going to talk about the importance of the light show in which uh, the mitochondria and the sun and melanin produce, but in a context of something very important for lots of people. It's a particular pharmaceutical that came out in the last couple of years, and it's showing now that it's having some unexpected effects. Uh, but again, Jack talks about how he predicted these effects, but it's really important that you take on board this information. And if you could share the video if possible, because it's the kind of topic that sometimes uh, social media doesn't share when it should. I've put Dr. Cruz's links in the description if you want to reach out to him for a consultation. Also, if you want to work with me, I've got a coaching group, uh, a monthly coaching group, and the links are in the description there. I've also got some courses available and coming out that help to simplify quantum biology so that it makes it practical for the everyday person. I've split this interview into two parts just because there's a lot to digest in this if you're new to Dr. Cruz. And there are other podcasts for you to watch that this one is effectively piggybacked off. So that would be the Huberman podcast, the podcast I did with Dr. Cruz earlier in the year, and also the podcast with Dr. Cruz, Rick Rubin and RFK Jr. <laughs> Literally just got to my house in El Salvador. So um, how is it on the on the equator? Because I'm at the 30th latitude and it makes it's, a big it's difference. It's pretty hot. It's probably like, I don't know, it's probably like 87 degrees. But it's a little overcast. You can't even see the volcanoes behind me. But uh, Pacific Ocean also, Pacific Ocean that way looks pretty, looks sunny. Yes, but definitely the whole change in latitudes has a huge impact. And um, I suppose, I think um, for this podcast, I, I listened to the Demystify Science podcast, which led on from the Huberman podcast, the one we did earlier. And maybe I just wanted to start with everything revolves around electrons, protons and neutrons and how the human body can trap and store uh, energy as in in the water, in the melanin, in the vitamin D, and how there's too much emphasis on the food electrons. And for people who are not <clears throat> up to speed, they've got two other podcasts to listen to. And also the fact in our podcast, we talked about how mTOR pivots around um, UV light in the body and this particular light show that goes on and how biology runs light, our metabolism, our appetite, and maybe light therapy would be the future for drugs rather than actual biochemistry. Yeah, I mean, I, I any of that is okay by me. All you got to do is start shooting questions. Okay, the only question that was on my mind just out of the uh, box was, is there a UVA active form of vitamin D? Because I was thinking of the times when... Um, it's not. When the no, non-visual the non-visual photoreceptor system is the key part of the story of light. I actually have not posted that whole story yet. It's coming, but I've given it in bits and pieces. Like I talked about uh, the opsins, like three, four, and five. You know, melanopsin, neuropsin, and encephalopsin and i've only talked a little bit about encephalopsin in the current uh patreon series but the key at least for people who've been following my work for a long time the non-visual photoreceptor system actually is the base of biochemistry it's actually it's actually what 
Albert St. Georgie warned the world in his uh, Budapest Academy uh, talk. Like one of the things I think I told one of your country mates in his podcast, the Owen Sheesby guy. Yeah. That, that one of the most amazing things about Albert St. Georgie is that even though he won a Nobel prize for, you know, elucidating part of the Krebs cycle, even though he was incorrect, you know, if you look back history wise, he didn't have it all right. Krebs is the one that had it right. And that's the reason why it's called the Krebs cycle and not the Albert St. Georgie cycle. Um, but what Albert St. Georgie did was so monumental. Um, the, I think the thing that he gets no credit for, and he should get a ton, is he realized that proteins in this cycle all had an electronic structure. They actually all look like semiconductors. He's the first person ever in centralized science to actually point that out to the public. And the interesting thing is this Budapest study that I always talk about, or I should say talk, that is actually the talk that Robert O. Becker heard when he was a medical student. And that talk had a massive impact on Becker. So the way I look at this from my perspective is Albert St. Georgie basically was a theoretical quantum biologist when he made that speech in Budapest. What Becker effectively became was the experimental quantum biologist who actually proved for the first time that actually all biology is run um, by semiconductive proteins. Now, he did it in bone, but now we know that it's present in just about every other system. But I would tell you from 1957 through 1963, when Becker wrote all this stuff, we are now 60 years away from that. If you think about the last 60 years in centralized science, how little has been done to build on that framework, it's almost pathetic. And part of the reason for that, and I'm sure you know this as a PhD, was because we had Watson and Crick in 53. Uh, and that's when DNA and RNA came in. And that's when everybody started focusing on that. But, you know, I've got to give uh, Watson and Crick some credit. If you go back and read the original paper, which very few people have done, do you know, you'll find out in there that they actually talked about solid state physics in that paper, that they felt that uh, DNA actually worked via the electronic state and also from proton tunneling because of the phosphate back chain, I should say the phosphate uh, atoms and the sugar, the way um, it was present on the triple helix. And it's kind of one of those things that's a lost footnote in history, just like the stuff I'm telling you about St. Georgie. To me, those two seminal events you know, I always, I told you Uberman in the podcast that I think we went off the rails with Gerwich in 23. But the truth be told, we actually came back in 53 through probably 63. But nobody picked up the torch since then, as far as I'm concerned. Did Watson and Crick elucidate the magnetic strip nature of DNA and the golden ratio in it? Or was that um, too? No, they all they did was casually mention that they felt that DNA clearly was a molecule that had an electronic uh, configuration state because it was so radically different than just about any other protein that they had found, you know, after they did, you know, after Rosalind Franklin did the diffraction studies with X-ray. I mean, she actually should have won the Nobel Prize, but didn't. Um, but they did mention, you know, quantum processes in there. And when you consider the time, you know, where we were, I mean, quantum mechanics and, and I mean, biochemistry was truly an infant at that time, but quantum mechanics was probably, I'm going to tell you from probably 1923, 25 to this time. So we're only talking 25 years that we're out. It clearly wasn't formalized yet. Um, 
it was going through fights. Like the people that helped found it didn't even believe it. Um, but the big, the big conference that I think a lot of people look at as the beginning of quantum mechanics is when all the guys who put their two cents in was the Solvay conference in 27. That's, that's kind of, I think when everybody looks at the beginning, um, but I've been uh, to this day, I'm still pretty amazed since Becker, like nothing's been done. Like when you listen to what I said in the RFK podcast, um, one of the things that I was absolutely so excited to hear from him is that if he gets elected president, he wants to remove the focus from an RNA and DNA and, and actually focus in on mitochondria. And, you know, why is that important? Because ultimately, when you start to focus in on mitochondria, that's where actually the biophoton, um, for want of a better term, the electromagnetic spectrum of what a cell is capable of occurs. And then all the processes that we're talking about that St. Georgie and Becker found, you begin to see uh, these are the levers. Like metabolism creates the electromagnetic spectrum uh, that's possible in a cell. The other thing, obviously, that happens, melanin plays a huge role in this. Why? Because melanin is the third major semiconductor in mammals that has been expanded. We are the one clade um, that expanded on that. The first one, obviously, being chlorophyll. Second one being hemoglobin. Third one, I think, being melanin. Fourth one is probably collagen. And what we specialize in, uh, our clade, from 65 million years forward is we basically have moved the melanin semiconductor from the outside to the inside to augment the mitochondrial story that began 65 million years ago, uh, or actually not really 65 million years ago. Uh, I'm going to give Lynn Margulis some credit here. Endosymbiosis with both chloroplast and, and mitochondria, when we stole you know, the archaea bacteria combination. And then we innovated, you know, across the landscape for that. That actually made melanin, um, how shall we say, I th I guess the word, the best word to use for a scientific per perspective is more bioavailable so that we could use it to a do a lot of different things. And that allowed for much more complexity you know, in the mammalian clade for the last 65 million years. Uh, the, yeah, that's yeah. like that's that's like the basic 80,000 foot, you know, framework to look at this whole story. But isn't the mitochondria like a kaleidoscope of um, light spectrum and you've got something like 10 to the 36 possible choices of signaling and then melanin is the thing you which do. makes it from the but outside because melanin can also absorb and emit all, well, I'd imagine, emit all wavelengths. So it's the kaleidoscope and it's like I think of it as a giant piano with 10 to the 36 um keys and that's how all of the programming and the complexity comes and there's infinite possibilities of what you can do with that many choices of individual um frequencies of light and i think you've also said the mitochondria is like an ocean inside us so it's the fractal nature of the universe the big on the outside and we've got miniature versions inside yeah i i like your characterization the only thing i would say is life for 3.8 billion years hasn't used 10 to the 36th. Hmm. In fact, we've used very little of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, which is pretty ironic. But you're right in saying it's a kaleidoscope. But here's the interesting thing. Small molecular weight uh, compounds are how we change the kaleidoscope. See, that's that's the real story that actually, in my view, since Becker's time to now has not been developed and teased out. And that's why when I talked to Bobby Kennedy about this, before we even did the podcast, he made a commitment that one of the first things that he's going to do, if he gets in, he's going to change the funding in the NIH where he's going to cut people off at the RNA and DNA thing and start going for the mitochondrial basis because he understands that, the mitochondrial basis of disease explains chronic disease metrics. And that's actually what's killing us, you know, in the modern world. And he goes, why are we focusing in 
on things that really aren't killing us. He goes, it's almost ridiculous. And it, I mean, the obvious answer <laughs> that we teased out in that podcast is because big pharma wants to keep us there because that's how we keep patients as customers and not uh, able to reverse diseases. And that's not his focus and clearly not my focus. He came to that realization as, you know, a PI attorney suing companies uh, and then became, I don't want to characterize him as anti-vax because I don't think he is anti-vax. I think he's anti certain vaxes. And I think he's also anti um, the schedule of vaccines that we have for kids. I feel exactly the same way about that. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I've been characterized since this podcast has come out as, you know, the classic anti-vaxxer and I'm, I'm not, I actually, I don't have a problem with all vaccines. I have two problems. I have a problem with this vaccine because of the story that developed on that podcast, because I knew that SV40 was going to wind up in it because I understood the technology as it was being developed from guys like uh, Robert Malone. If you read the original patents, you knew that there was going to have to be some way uh, when they're creating a GMO um, version of the vaccine, they were going to have to get this messenger RNA somehow across the nuclear membrane. And the only way to get that genetic information across the nuclear membrane is to use the SV40 promoter. And because, and this is, this is a really important point for people to understand. Um, and I think it's going to be an, a, an important point for history because um, I'm sure there'll be critics that come out. When you go back and look at the COVID reveal documentary that I did, which most of your listeners probably have never seen it because they didn't pay for it. It had to be behind a paywall because if you had heard what I said in 20 and 21 about this vaccine, the most curious thing about the vaccine development from my perspective, and you'll understand why, because you now have heard the Bobby Kennedy podcast, is that there was two legal definitions for the vaccine. And the reason for that is one was tested by the FDA without DNA plasmids and without SV40. That's why they got passed. The other one was where they had the plasmids and the SV40 in it. And what did they wind up doing? They used the ones with SV40 and the plasmids to actually get past the nuclear membrane. And that's the one that everybody got injected with. And this is the craziest part of the story, Sarah, because we're we're just here now. Um, literally, we're, we're talking maybe 10 days after this podcast. The day the podcast got released, they started to alter the SV40 Wikipedia page. And the reason why is they want people to think that it's normal to have SV40 in the human genome, and it's not. Remember, in the podcast with Bobby Kennedy, what did I say? Um, SV40 shows up in African green monkeys, okay? In African green monkeys, it has no pathologic uh, basis. But when you put SV40 in any other sentient thing, it creates cancer. The The original Sarah, not Sarah Pugh, but Sarah Stewart, that's the reason she got interested in the viral vector's cause of cancer. And that's why she wrote her treatise. That treatise is what was found in David Ferry's apartment the day that he was killed by the CIA. And um, I don't think you're a member of my site anymore, but oh, I, oh, you... I am. I, I'm a silver member, so I, I've listened to I've listened to all your powwows as well, so I can. Oh, did you hear the I... latest powwow? Um, yeah. uh, doctor, who's now a, he's not. I don't think he's the current coroner of New Orleans, but his name's Jeff Rouse. He's one of my members. I just did a Q and A on Sunday. I don't know if you've listened to the review yet because as a silver member you have you don't hear it live you have to hear the recording he said that in he's looked at david ferry's autopsy ferry had plier marks on his tongue and there was other unusual things found in the coroner report and he as the coroner was able to go back and look through that the interesting thing is none of that 
was disclosed to um, to uh, Jim Garrison, who prosecuted Clay Schwab. And the interesting thing was Bobby Kennedy didn't know any of that. This is the reason why I wanted to talk to him, because I told him the coroner at that time was a guy named Nick Chetta. And his dad, before his he was killed, his dad actually called Nick Chetta and asked, was there any nefarious things in the uh, autopsy? And he was told, Bobby Kennedy was told no. And my members heard this Sunday that that wasn't true. That one of the coroners of New Orleans right now actually has read the report and there was nefarious changes. And the thing is, I've known about this for so long. I, there's a lot of people in New Orleans that knows bits and pieces about this, but they don't know all the things that I know because they didn't know the parts about how the Linac came into this. And that, you know, gets to what you were asking me about in the beginning about the kaleidoscope. It turns out that when you use the electromagnetic spectrum outside this, the octaves that we use outside, I want to use the term you used, the kaleidoscope that you mentioned, that it has some effects that are very counterintuitive. So in the podcast, I, I made a comment about um, a molecular biologist from the 80s named Schlemmer. We knew from, you know, 30 years after all this bullshit happened, in the, the bioweapons lab on Magazine Street, that the normal base rate of intercalation of DNA plasmids or SV40 was about 7%. When you irradiate someone outside the kaleidoscope spectrum that you want to talk about, guess what happens? The intercalation rate goes up. So what does that mean for people now that have heard the Bobby Kennedy interview? I mean, you're going to hear your interview they're going to go, wait a minute, if I rolled my sleeve up, took the jab, what's the effect of 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, now the new 6G? And I'm going to tell you, that's the reason why not everybody who got the jab is going to get a soft tissue cancer. I don't want anybody to think that. But the people that have low redox that are tech abusers, those are the people that you heard in the podcasts. And I think it got cut. I don't think you guys did hear it, but they did hear it in Lisbon when I gave the talk that the guy named the ethical skeptic on Twitter, he is a Naval intelligence officer who's been posting literally for two and a half years. He and I have been following each other for that long. He's the first person that I know that actually picked up the pulse of non COVID non uh, viral problems in the data. And the first place he got the clue was in the UK. The first place he got the clue was in Germany. The first place he got the clue was in Israel. And he's the one that picked up the soft tissue cancer spike. In other words, people were dying who were really young, who didn't have COVID related injuries. You know, you know, you remember as a woman from the UK, especially from that jackass Ferguson, um, he's like, everybody needs to go locked down. And the people that are obese and have low vitamin Ds, they're the ones that are at risk and they need to be vaccinated. The craziest part of the story, the people that are dying now aren't those people. Now it's the healthy people that took the jab who are huge tech abusers. And to make sense of this, Sarah, you actually have to have the mitochondrial perspective. You have to understand that mitochondrial metabolism is what creates the kaleidoscope that actually runs the light show inside of a cell that works with melanin. So the key question is when you inject something exogenously um, that can get broken down by the immune system to smaller molecular weight things, what are the collateral effects that come from that? Well, one thing is clotting. One thing is long COVID. One thing is soft tissue cancers. The soft tissue cancers mostly I believe are related to the intercalation of the promoter of SV40. Now, the two guys that I highlighted in the Bobby Kennedy interview and in my talk in Lisbon, when I was allowed to speak uh, by the administration of El Salvador on their behalf about this, um, 
Philip Buckholtz and Kevin McKiernan, everybody who listens to your podcast needs to follow these guys. Why? Because Kevin McKiernan, he is the Bernice Eddy of Cutter 1.0. He has told the world the truth. He, I mean, the crazy thing is he worked in the Human Genome Project, so he's got significant, uh, I should say, scientific chops, but now he works in the cannabis industry, and because he works in the cannabis industry, everybody thinks that you know he's kind of a fly-by-night guy, and he's not. I mean, this guy has got, he's probably one of the top 10 molecular biologists in the world. Philip Buckholz, who's an absolute jackass, who's part of the centralized paradigm, He's actually blocked me because of what I'm telling you right now. Um, he has no idea how the kaleidoscope and biophotons interact. Remember, you, you may get mad at me when I tell you this, but I think you'll understand it. PhDs know a lot about that big a part of science. Okay? That's the problem with a guy like Buckholz. And Buckholz thinks, because we don't have any definitive proof that the cancers that are being generated since the jab have SV40 in them. Why? Not because it's not true. It's because no one's tested it. And this is the reason why the UK, uh, the, the, um, the government in Canada, and even the FDA have not pulled this stuff off the market. They want the marketplace to do the studies. But I'm going to tell you, this is going to be really bad news and this is where Bobby Kennedy and I really do think the rubber meets the road. If it's proven that these jabs have plasmid uh, contamination, that's not covered in their legal liability law of 1986 in the United States. I can tell you it's not covered in the law in the UK right now. They, they have huge risks already outside of it. Do I think that Bobby's plan to unleash uh, attorneys to sue them will lead to some bankruptcies of some of these vaccine companies. I actually think that's, that's possible and probable, even if he doesn't get elected. Why? Because the data is overwhelming now. Why? Because what McKinnon has done, he's actually now been proven and reaffirmed multiple times. I think we're up to 12 different studies now that have shown that what he originally said several months ago is now, in fact, true. The last step, the smoking gun, is now to link SV40 and the spike protein to the different diseases. And I can tell you that this is where mitochondrial medicine and the story that you want to talk about, the kaleidoscope, is a big deal. What do you need to know if we take the jab story out of it, um, what's the smallest molecular weight issue that changes um, the kaleidoscope? That's what deuterium does. Deuterium well, my is the basic, right, it's the basic mechanism of how the kaleidoscope, like I want people to think about the kaleidoscope like a transmission, but it has, as you said, 10 to the 36 gears. So you need to understand what changes it. Not only does light frequency change it, but it turns out small molecular weight issues change it. So instead of using these fancy little terms, let's make it to something that people will understand. This is what single nucleotide polymorphisms are, and this is what single amino acid polymorphisms are. On my pat Patreon blog, I believe it was uh, quantum engineering number 61, I actually laid out a whole blog post that told you what C terminus and N terminus changes are to the protein. This gets to the core of what Albert St. Georgie and Becker really found. You read that blog, you will not see Albert St. Georgie's name. You will not see Becker's name. They'll have to listen to this podcast and read that Patreon blog and synthesize the things that we're talking about now because, you know, there's functional medicine people out there that are selling people an absolute line of bullshit about SNPs and SAPs. They have no earthly idea that SIPs and SNAPs are actually what changed the kaleidoscope in the mitochondria. And when you change the mitochondria uh, metabolism, you effectively change its biophoton signature. That's how the spectrum changes. And that spectral change 
is what controls the biochemistry. But then and, what, um, an amino acid chain, it change in one of the proteins change the semiconduction system in the whole body like an yeah, but I, you're missing the point again i, I want to stop you i'm going to interrupt you it's not a change in the amino amino acid it can be a change on the carboxy group or oh. the nh2 group like that's a how small the change can be what just a deuterium instead of a hydrogen correct and okay. this is what people don't understand you know they they've you don't need a single amino acid change. See, that's what Buchholz believes. Mm -hmm. Buchholz believes that you have to have uh, somatic mutations in order to make a difference. That's the, the central idea of modern molecular biology. That is absolutely incorrect. And the reason it's incorrect is for what you wanted to talk to me about, the kaleidoscope. They have no earthly idea that biophotons even exist. Like I even in, in the post that I put out to Buckholz before he banned me, it was Roland Van Wick's book about life sculpting life. He has no earthly idea that you can change mitochondrial um, signaling just by changing small molecular uh, weight uh, proteins that mitochondria interact with. That happens, you know, on the Minos layer. Um, it happens on the inner mitochondrial membrane. It happens on the outer mitochondrial membrane. It, it, the smallest atomic mass thing that's capable of doing this is deuterium because it operates on the uncoupling proteins. You know, I wrote that about that literally 10 years ago. Mm. You know, did webinars for my members about that. Um, you know, when people talk about seed oils, they, they want to focus in on the biochemistry. Those, those are the people like the guy fire in the bottle on Twitter or Tucker Goodrich. Uh, Gulhane, they want to tell you that it's all about the linoleic acid, but they don't realize the real problem with the linoleic acid is the goddamn deuterium that's in it. It's It turns out the processing of that deuterium, when it goes to the wrong place, that is what changes the kaleidoscope of signaling changes. What I'm trying to tell you is that's exactly the same thing that's happened with the spike protein. As it gets metabolized, or if it doesn't get metabolized, um, and the same thing that's present in many of the medications and the jabs that we take have the same effect. And all the it's supplements true. from this functional medicine doctors are just here Absolutely. loaded. Absolutely. And this is the reason why I have been very consistent in just about every podcast, every Q and a, everything I've ever said. If you listen to guys like Mark Sisson, Rob Wolf and Dave Asprey, and you keep taking supplements, you will not get to the promised land. Okay. And, and the reason why is because they don't understand the biophysics that's being elucidated. For example, one of the, probably the biggest outcomes, I think, you know, people worry about the soft tissue cancers and all the other bullshit, uh, the, like the clot shots from AstraZeneca in your country. Um, the thing I'm worried about the most, I think the number one side effect so far has been uh, long COVID. Long COVID, I think, comes from abnormal breakdown of the spike protein that actually causes changes in the C-terminus and N-terminus uh, changes. And that leads to mitochondrial heteroplasmy rate. And that changes the kaleidoscope of biophoton release. And it ruins everything in there. In fact, the only way I think to fix that problem right now is you have to get apoptosis going on. Um, of the, the the mitochondria in question to get rid of them. And here's here's where the story gets kind of, you have to really be a true scientist here. Uh, what is one of the first things that SV40 attaches to in the cell when it gets in there? P53, what is P53 control? Accounts of apoptosis. Mm. But it controls apoptosis. And guess what? Every single cancer is associated with defective apoptosis. What also controls apoptosis? Melatonin levels. What do you know about mitochondria? They make melatonin. So when you see all these fibers coming down and you understand all these parts, you begin to realize what Uncle Jack has been telling people for three or four years. I didn't have the proof that this was going to happen, but I had a pretty strong feeling that it was going to happen because this kind of stuff has been happening with supplements. It's been happening with GMO foods. 
It's been happening with processed foods. It's been happening with the miRNAs that we're putting in rice, in wheat, in grains. It's it's the real story about what Monsanto was doing with you know the GMOs way back in the day. That actually, I think Bobby did a great job in the 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 podcast that I did with him and Rick. He laid that case out extremely well. Um, the problem is the story that's being sold to the public, like the people who are going to listen to your podcast, they don't have all the missing pieces, Sarah. And, and I said this on the podcast and I'm going to say it to you again, clearly. So you understand this perspective. What is the difference between fact and fiction? It's a rhetorical question for you. I'm going to tell you the answer. Fiction has to make sense. The truth does it. So because the truth doesn't make sense, it gives deniable plausibility to Monsanto, to the government, to Pfizer, to Moderna, to AstraZeneca, that guys like me, guys like McCullough, guys like Malone, guys like the ethical skeptic, guys like Kevin McKiernan, we're conspiracy theorists. Why? Because you don't have all of the pieces and parts to the story. But guess what happened in the Bobby Kennedy interview? He wrote an absolute beautiful book on Fauci from Fort Detrick going forward to took you all the way to 2023. What did Uncle Jack do? All the stuff that everybody else thought was conspiracy from Fort Detrick behind, I gave you all the missing pieces. All of a sudden, it's not conspiracy there. In fact, it was the reason the people that pay me paid me. Why I told them not to take this jab under any circumstances, because I saw the breadcrumbs from Cutter One in the approval process with no safety testing, because they knew exactly what they were doing. And then when I saw the legalese that was in the emergency use authorization that I talked about in the COVID revealed movie, like you guys go back and read and watch that movie. You see what McCullough said and what Malone said in that movie. And then look what I said. Our focus was completely different because I knew something that even those guys didn't know. That SV40 was going to be in these jabs. It had to be because if you looked at the original patents that Malone did, it's the only way to get um, the messenger RNA promoter across the nuclear membrane. It's the only way to do it. And guess what? Molecular biology for literally 30 years, that's exactly what they've been used in SV40. What did I do to double and triple down? I went and read the patents on Moderna's vaccine and Pfizer's. It's written right in the patents. Now, could I post this on Twitter? No, because you know what would happen. But guess who did post it? Kevin McKiernan. Why? Because he didn't know any of the story, Sarah, about Cutter One. He had no earthly idea. The, the reason why these molecular biologists who are PhDs, I can't hold like a guy like Buckholtz, even though I totally think he's a despicable human being for some of the things that he said. I can't hold them as frauds as scientists because... None of the stuff that I revealed in the Bobby Kennedy interview was ever published because it was a covert operation of the CIA. So scientists would have no way of knowing this. And the reason I'm doing the things that I'm doing now, telling you this story is because this story is going to be whitewashed from history. Just go look at what happened to the Wikipedia page from October 25th. 2023 to right now, which is what, November 14th, you won't believe the edits that have gone on in the page. But Wikipedia is corrupt as shit. It's, it always, do, it does this all the time. So it's. It Sarah, that's not good me. enough because guess what? At least 60% of the world but, uses yeah. and votes based on what's on Wikipedia. So your criticism right there. Is not good enough. Pissing in the wind. Yeah, it's got to get out. Correct. Yeah. It's not. And people need to know the truth because guess what? What I've said to everybody, you can't trust anyone. 
And when you don't know the real science of how things really work, you are apt to make huge mistakes. This is the reason why I am the biggest pain in the ass for functional medicine, for chiropractors, for allopathic medicine doctors, for other podcasters, who people who just don't understand why I am the way I am. Now you're finding out the reason I am the way I am, because I saw how the science was perverted, corrupted, and then used against the public health for the last 60 years. And it's not stopped. Like, don't, don't misunderstand me here. I don't think anybody is going to become a black swan mitochondria because of this SV40 story. In fact, I think the real story where people are going to change is when they realize the other side of this is their money is being corrupted to pay for all this shit. Okay. That is where people are going to go. What do you mean? My money's not worth any. What do you mean? I can't take my money out of the bank. That is going to lead to social changes in huge cities where people will go into people's houses and take from them when they can't get their money out of the bank. And I keep telling my members, all you have to do is look at what's going on in the bond market at the same time this scientific story is going on. They are absolutely linked together. And until people get off their damn asses and start thinking and understanding where this connects, we're never going to get people to be black swan mitochondria. It's like if you think that you are going to fix your mitochondrial disease by doing half the shit that a functional medicine guy is going to do. And I, I'm on, I'm, I'm, I'm tripling down what I'm saying. Functional medicine doctors are as bad as allopathic doctors that write you a prescription for status because they're doing the same thing with their supplements. And the mechanism is there. They are ruining the kaleidoscope biophoton spectrum that your cell requires for optimal health. And you all need to realize that. You need to become aficionados of nature. And yes, here's the really bad news. You do need to come to Jack's level. No, I'm not going to dumb it down for you. I'm absolutely not. Because I know another interesting side of nature. Not everybody's going to survive, Sarah. They're not. No. Certain people are going to listen to your podcast. They're going to get it. And other people are going to go say, well, that's all well and good. But, you know, I just need the drive through version. What, what, what can I do? That's why I opened it with everything's electrons, protons and neutrons. And that's how I look at everything now, because I don't know everything, but I can sometimes work it out if I go back to the deuterium, because everything always pins back to deuterium and electrons and protons. And if I can think in that way, I mean, yeah, I'm going to die, but, you know, you can pass the message on and maybe change, get other people to look at things through a physics lens, because I'll happily well, change my way of thinking because biology is too primitive. Even as a biochemist, it doesn't, I can't answer questions in a biological language, but I can make sense of it in protons, neutrons, electrons, and deuterium and light and energy transfer. And that's all I've got to find well, truth. Think, think about what you just said. You're, you're a modern woman, 2023. You've got a PhD in biochemistry. And think about what I just said. In 1941, one of the fathers of centralized biochemistry told us that we should be looking in this area and we haven't done a goddamn thing since then. That is absolutely pathetic. I'm talking about when you actually sit back in your chair and think about it, the return on equity of centralized science literally since 1941 is pathetic. And this is the reason why we now spend $4.3 trillion in the United States and everybody's sicker than hell. But we have the centralized doctors like you pick the doc. I'm not going to throw any of them under the bus. I've thrown enough people under the bus the last five years. But you can pick anyone out. Um, they they are out there telling people, uh, well, this is the best way for longevity. Well, take a look at the return on equity. The stuff that's evidence-based is horrible. There's nothing about it that you should look at. You heard what I said to Uberman. When, when he had the discussion with Eddie Chang, Eddie Chang said probably 50%. And what's the collateral effects incalculable? I said it's 99% because none of the things that we just talked about are ever talked about 
there's no light controls and god forbid like uh, you know some somebody on my twitter feed this week was putting some bullshit from joe mercola on my feed about you know his hydrogen tablets i'm like okay tell me what the 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 level of protium versus deuterium are in his tablets he can't even tell you so guess what that means if you're taking those damn things but it's exp yeah. that's the thing is it's all money it's expensive if you want to fractionate at the level of the gas you've got to pay extra money to get pure uh, proteum and they're going to lose profit so they just don't want anybody to know that you can put you can start your process cleaner because it will cost more money to make supplements and it, everything you've said all revolves around follow the money right and that you know what this is the reason why my message, I know, is an inconvenient truth for the public. I, you know, I make no bones about it, but I'm going to tell you that you need to listen to what Uncle Jack's telling you because I am not fucking lying to anybody. I'm telling you the truth. And it's your job, if you choose to accept Mission Impossible, is to understand what I'm saying. And look, all of us, collectively, all of us, every country in the world has lived through the last three years. If you can, no matter what your ideology is, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, independent, communist, fascist, whatever. How can you look in the mirror and say, these fuckers didn't lie to us? Now you have them on the internet asking for mea culpas. Oh, well, we didn't know. Well, if you didn't know, why did you mandate people in the UK roll up their sleeves? Or people in the United States, you want to get on a plane, you got to roll up your sleeves. Based on the data that we know now, just think about that. And these are people that need to go to jail. No, they don't need fines. They need to be stopped. The, the thing that I disagreed with Bobby, but you won't get that on the podcast because a lot of stuff was trimmed, cut, and edited, is he thinks putting some of these big pharma businesses out of business and bankrupt, I mean, is going to change things. I don't. I think we need medical freedom laws in countries, in constitutions. Why? No one, no one, no government should have control over your health. Zero. Even when they're paying the health care bill, there has to be informed consent between the patient and the doctor. And that should be the gold standard. And that's not what's present anywhere in the world. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to try to fix that problem next. That's my next big goal. Be sure to join Dr. Cruz and I for the second part of this interview, which will be up very shortly if it's not up already. So thanks for watching and see you soon.